welcome into episode 46 of the Level Flight Podcast. I've got Elliot back with me. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> and we are ready to talk not about training camp because we did that last yeah. week. Uh, yeah. We were ready. Training camp starts tomorrow. When you're hearing this, it starts today uh, at the Hockey for All Center. But we previewed it last week. We gave our thoughts. So go check that out. It was a great episode. It was just Brian and I, but maybe we'll do some rapid fire with Elliot today just to get yeah. his, his, his blanket thoughts. Um, but there are other things to talk about. Um, and we are going, we're going to preview the season. We're going to do some fun predictions, some award predictions, my uh, favorite time of the year. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's prediction time. And then later in the program, we're going to have Jacob Stoller of the hockey news. Come on. Jacob has come on in the past. He's great. I can't wait to do that interview with him. Um, that's going to be a lot of fun, but for the time being, it's just Elliot and I. So let's let's let's, let's ride. Um, the Jets, the how do I even bring this up? The the media members, Scott Billick, Murata Tesh, a few others, brought up the fact that the Jets are releasing a special jersey at eleven forty five a.m. for fan oh, fest. I, yeah, yeah. What what are your initial thoughts on that? Because I I got really nothing. This has been a weird, like I'm, I'm all for new jerseys and looking at redesigns and doing that. And I think it's been long enough. The Jets have most, some teams only do it every like five or six years. Like the Jets right. have been back since 2011 and we're going on 2023, 2024. Like we're past season 10. Like, so for me in the modern era, probably should do a little bit of a redesign. The Jets are kind of going old school and trying to keep their logo. But I realistically think this new jersey, there's just... There, there was speculation it was just one jersey and then the Jets came, well somebody else from media said that the Jets were coming out with their this season jersey plus an extra one so we have no idea what to expect at FanFest but all I'm going to say is they've been teasing the Heritage jerseys all summer every time that they've posted something but I'm going to tell you right now the guys and I were talking about it and the only way that anything changes is if they go heritage jerseys with current logo because the Jets soon after that news, like it might have been actually sometime last night, the Jets mm -hmm. tweeted out a video about them putting on the logo. And that obviously would have been a dead giveaway if it was the heritage logo. Cause then you kind of go, Oh, okay. Well, like then they're go rolling heritage this year. Cause they, somebody yeah. was it Carter Brooks that tweeted out the uh, locker room photo with yes, the, with the, yeah, with the see, and that, and that's where everything gets weird because you look at that photo and that photo got posted earlier in the day, about midday, maybe one o'clock, one thirty, Right. And there was no logo on the carpet and you could see on the name bars. It was the same old logo, but they had the heritage stuff hung up. Well, then they post the video in the evening and it's the logo, the two, the jets 2.0 logo. So right. what, what, what do you do? Like what, when you're trying to speculate something like this, it's, I, I personally just think, that them using the heritage stuff is some sort of media like thing to try to get drum up about it. They're just trying to get people to talk. And plus I know the guys, yeah. the guys seem to like to wear the heritage stuff. So I'm sure it's probably just something we'll see tomorrow at training camp. If they all come out in heritage stuff, then maybe that's another tell, but maybe we'll, ha we'll have to see on Saturday because I have no idea what they're going to do. And realistically, yes, I love jerseys, but it doesn't really matter that much. Like, yeah, if they if they go heritage colors, throw the 2.0 logo on there, and that's that. Like, cool. Yeah. But there, there's really not much else you can do essentially. So yeah, I, I mean, it is what it is. Yeah the the main jerseys. I'm interested to see where that whole thing came from because all the reasons you said point to it not being the heritage, uh, and I don't really know what else they could do. But this is Scott Billick's tweet about you know how there's going to be brown gloves on this special jersey. Oh, yeah that too uh the the throwback hockey gloves it'll have a cream color to it i just i don't really know where this is going and i'm i'm really intrigued because mm -hmm. brown hockey gloves sounds great like this sounds like it could be a, a an amazing throwback uh like classic jersey yeah. that they bring to the modern era and that would be really cool but hmm. I, I really, 
I've never been as lost on a topic as I am this one. I just I yeah. don't know where this is going whatsoever. And and there's also been some rumblings, like Billick says, about the RCAF stuff. People have been posting about like, you know, the whole oh the the here's the jersey that the moose wore and whatever, and they're gonna do something similar to this. I mean, cool. If that's what the special jersey is, that's cool. But like realistically, at the end of the day, the Jets have release so many different jerseys and they'll probably wear them all again this year they did that last yeah. year like yeah so it's not i know some i've seen some people they're worried that certain jerseys are gonna get taken away or they're not gonna wear specific ones but they they could have done that because they've got the they've got the old light blue ones and then they've got the right. retros and then they've got the hair all the heritage jerseys and it's just they 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 know I hate to say this because we talked about this already a while back. It's a money ploy. That's the whole reason why they keep bringing back all the jerseys. It's so right. that they wear them so that more people will buy them. So, yeah. well, now you got to get an Adam Lowry captain jersey. So, I'm like, there you go. Yeah. yeah. I actually heard that there is a lot of people going into places, going, get, getting the C stitched on, which is cool. I mean, you, you yeah. want that if you have an Adam Lowry jersey. So, well, well and, and, and that's the other thing. Why, un- unless this brand, here, here's my, here's my major take. I will always be someone to go to a store and get something stitched onto a jersey that I've already bought rather than go buy a brand new one. The only exception would be if this brand new jersey for this season has some cool patch on it or there's some right. special specific thing. Like people will clown me. He just retired. I have an Adam Lowry 2010, 11 captain Jersey. Andrew Ladd. You mean, Sorry, what I was I like, he, you were like, he just retired. Adam Lowry. I'm like, <laughs> Adam Lowry? What? Did I miss something. Yeah. No, Sorry. Okay, Andrew Ladd. Andrew I am, Ladd. <laughs> we're, we're a little under the weather over here. Um, <laughs> the brain's still trying to function. Um, yeah, yeah, Andrew Ladd jersey, and that has the inaugural season patch, right? Like, I paid extra for that. Like, obviously, I'm going to do that. Unless this brand new jersey has this cool patch on it, or the C is a different shape than what they normally have, or, like, that's the only reason why I would ever buy a brand new one. I commend all the people going and buying an Adam Lowry jersey for right. this year, and just buy, it. like, already has the jersey, and just buying the C. Because you can go buy that. You can get whoever to stitch that. They can go to any sports jersey store and get that stitched on so yeah yeah it's the right thing to do especially if you already have a lowry jersey it's don't nice need to pay another 300 dollars. exactly exactly um enough with the jersey talk i i'm so lost on that but we can move on um the young stars tournament wrapped up the jets went one and two uh just quick initial thoughts i thought nikita chibrikov was like the best forward of all of them, all of the first round picks, whatever. I think he was the best forward. Elias Salmonson looked great. I mean, we've talked with Scott Wheeler a few weeks ago, and he talked about how good his year one was after being drafted. Uh, I thought he carried that up or carried that into training camp. And then the goaltending. I mean, Dominic DiVincentis and Thomas Millich were under siege at times, and they were fine. They handled it great. They like the the second game the jets played the canucks and mm-hmm. jamie thomas um was saying yesterday that i think this was on winnipeg sports talk he was saying how the canucks sent basically their abbotsford team like they sent a bunch of ahl guys um and it was like a men versus boys situation and despite that in the first period despite getting outshot like by crazy amount, Thomas Milich kept the Jets in the game. So the goaltending is definitely something to be excited about. But quick rapid fire takeaways. I, I like Chiprikov, Salamonson, and the goaltending. I'm gonna have to agree with you on Chiprikov. He looked the best. I mean, like somebody tweeted it out at some point. There's a bunch of guys like and I'm not trying to say they weren't working hard, but you can kind of tell that guys like Barlow and some of the other guys like I don't want to put too many names out there, but one of the names that did come up was Barlow in the tweet about, well, training camps a week away, the actual Jets training camp, their season is right around the corner. A lot of guys weren't trying to play super hard not because they hurt did, Yeah, they're not trying to get hurt. Yeah. So, because this is just a fun tournament. So, as much as right. I know people love to take away, it's like, oh, here's all the prospects playing together and da 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 da. You can't take too much because one guy's no. not going to be playing it. Full, they're going to be playing hard. They're going to play hard, but they're not playing full tilt, risking injury, right? So right. 
you can't you can't take too much away from it. Um, I I thought the goaltending was great. Here here may be or may not be a hot take. After the last two Jets draft picks of goaltenders, mm-hmm. I may say that they have. And and you can say them wrong, and I know it's just the youngsters tournament, but both of them had really good years in their leagues last year, and we'll see mm-hmm. how it goes. Milich has to play this year in the AHL. Do right. the Jets? Turn for yeah, yeah. He, do the Jets have the best? And I'm not saying best goaltender prospect. Do they have the best goaltender prospect pool? What other team has two goalies uh... that have looked that good it, against their own age group? And in a in a tournament, we'll see how it goes this year. But have, I feel like I feel, feel like, like it's definitely that... a team like the Wild, who have like Jesper Wallstedt, who's a first round pick, that too, probably yeah. the best goalie prospect in the world. And then there's someone else. I have a feeling like they just always and, and maybe have, there like, is maybe, maybe, there, maybe is. there is yeah. But when you look at like. Devin Chentist, I think, was originally projected to be like a backup, and Milich, I think, was maybe like a fringe starter. But if it, my my take is is overall, like, yes, you've got guys like Yaroslav Askarov, you've guys got guys like Jesper Wallstead. But the question is, is those guys are top tier? Who's behind them? Right. That's where I right. think the Jets may have depth. Right. Yeah. Like Devin Chentis may end up being a starting cal a good starting caliber goaltender. Maybe not a Connor Hellebuck, Vesna caliber, but in today's NHL with so much scoring, yes, having an elite goaltender is good, but you just need a guy who's gonna make a couple saves a night that mm-hmm. win you some games. You don't with all the scoring and the point totals and with so many guys with skill, you're gonna get beat. Like there's just gonna be some games where you just can't stop guys because they're picking their spots so they're making great plays, right? So right. if the Jets have two prospects in the goaltending category that at least have starting projection, like even maybe a little bit better, yeah. I think that's I think that's really good. Like that is considering a couple years ago when we were kind of going, well, if this team gets older and Connor, there's nobody behind Connor. How like it was Mikhail right. Burden and like I guess you could say even last year was at the start of the year the goaltending prospects were Mikhail Burden and Oscari Salmanen. Yeah, but then Burden left, so it was Arvid Holm and a scary Salmon. And, and, yeah. and, and, and that's what I'm saying. Then it turns to that, and you kind of go, well, if either A, Connor Hellebuck goes down, or B, he leaves, who's your quote-unquote future goaltender? Right. Right? So, and these the, these two guys are probably still two, three years away, but the progress is there. They both, like you said, DiVincentis won OHL Goalie of the Year. Milic won WHL Goalie of the Year. You can't ask for much more than that. Out, out of your two goalie prospects as being the best goalie in the leagues they're playing. Millich won a WHL championship. They went to Memorial Cup weekend. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, um, North Bay was, I believe, either one or two games away from either the championship, like the either uh, winning the championship. I think they were lost they in the third like round. The third round. Ra- That's round what I was gonna say. I, th- yeah. I think yeah. they were like one or two games away. Like you, you can't. When, when you, I, I get that yeah. it's OHL and they're playing against guys between the ages of like 16 and 20, <laughs> but th- it's yeah. not like these leagues are slouches, right? Like, it's not no. like they're playing junior B and the Jets draft them and it's like, yeah, they're putting up 950 save percentages and below two or like below 150 goals against. And you go, well, look at the comp, right? Like, these guys are putting up elite numbers against guys their age. And they've now looked good against other top players in their age group because we saw them at. At um, at rookie camp, and they and they mm-hmm. both looked great as well, right? So yeah, and Milic, you know, on the national stage, World Juniors, he won the gold for Canada, that played too. great. Devin Chentis probably going to be the starter for Canada this year coming up. So you might have two goalies who are gold medal winners at the World Juniors, goalies of the year in both of their leagues. Um. And yeah, it's the progress is definitely there and it's going to be fun to track the next couple of years. I feel much better now if either a Connor Hellbuck is to leave or I feel also better just about the future of the goaltending because I know not every prospect hits, but you have to hope that one of these guys hit, even if they're just very solid starters, you sign them after their rookie deal to like a five year deal and then a two year extension or whatever the case is. And you get like a seven year run of solid goaltending the jets before connor hellebuck 
didn't like i mean you can say andre pavlik was uh, and then you go through all the other right hey i so, think pavlik was good he he we, was we good. don't have to get into that but I, either I way was I, I'm, I'm straying a little bit away <laughs> but just i feel really good about the future of the goaltending position mm-hmm. and the prospect pool and depth after what had it what it looked like even Yeah, and I I think that might change the way that the Jets view it too. Like the Jets might be more willing to move off of Connor Hellebuck if now that now that these goalies have shown that they're I mean they already have done what we're saying. Like the Young Absolutely. Stars tournament does, the Young Stars tournament doesn't change this. Uh but knowing that these goaltenders are excelling in their leagues and might be goal- your goalies of the future, it might be easier to move off of Hellebuck. Now they're still three, four years away. It's hard to project. There's yeah. a lot of caveats to that, but goalies are hard to project. Very, very. Um, well, let's, uh, let's get into some, some season predictions. I mean, I'm going to talk about training camp with Staller later. Um, mm-hmm. The only thing really that we didn't cover on the last one was the groupings Mm -hmm. and i think the only thing to take away from the groupings was the fact that cole perfetti is going to get the first look at second line center and the top line is going to be cal connor mark shifley gabriel velarde uh because those that's one group is connor shifley velarde the other group is nita rider perfetti ehlers so assuming that's those are the top, that's the top six, right? We talked about what yeah. our ideal top six going into training camp was. And we were pretty close to that. We, uh, Brian, I think said exactly that. He said, Connor, Shifley, Velarde, Nino, Perfetti, Ehlers. So um, what what were your takeaways from the groupings and basically the Cole Perfetti, Gabriel Velarde situation? Because that's really all you can take away from it. But that's, we're not, um, we're not predicting lines here. We're just right. <laughs> we're, we're just talking about um, the groupings. I mean, Velarde on the first slot on the top line. I don't mind. I don't think that that's right. the worst situation. I kind of like that they were going to have some depth with having Velarde and Perfetti on the second line. But if here's my other thing, I don't mind having Perfetti down the middle. If down his right wing, he's got Nikolai Ehlers. Right, like yeah. he Ehlers. I think that's a great match. Like those play styles really work well together. Yeah, I I think just his playmaking ability to either fire up a pass to Ehlers up the wing or to find Ehlers to be a finisher. Like I know Nino can be a finisher on the line, but I think he's mm-hmm. sort of good. I if you if we're taking this as the quote unquote lines or whatever what the, could be, I see Nino as being the guy to kind of pr- not protect Perfetti. We're not doing the like protect the young small guy fighting thing right protect not ryan the reeves guy. but no it's like ryan reeves but i think he's there to kind of add some grit to the line to kind of be a little mm-hmm. bit more of a power forward. i want to say more of a power forward more of a grind than a grinder player so right. he's going to chip in some points he's going to score he's going to finish he's going to battle in front of the net i think perfetti is going to be the playmaker i hope he shoots more this year because right. god forbid every single time that he touched the puck inside the slot and is looking for a pass when he should be shooting it on net. But I'm hoping that he's a playmaker. Yeah. And I just hope they just, I hope Rick bonus just lets Ehlers fly. Just yeah. absolutely lets him run wild. That is, I'm, I, I think, and again, this, I'm actually, I don't think this is a hot take. If Cole Perfetti stays healthy, I think Nick Ehlers has a, and then they figure it out together. I think they have an enormous season. I think Ehlers yeah. absolutely goes off and is just like, the, I'm not saying he's going to be the, we'll talk about team MVP and who we think is right. going to probably put up the most points on this team. I don't think he's going to do that, but I think he's going to go back to, as long as he stays healthy and Perfetti stays healthy, I think those two be, go back to old versions of themselves. I think we see old Ehlers just put up points. And I'm, yeah. I'm really excited for that. Because I mean, he could put up points with Connor and Shifley, but both those guys are shooters. Right? right, I think Velarde could be more of a. I think he could. I he reminds me of a little bit less of the power forward role, but kind of that in between two way player that Nino is with the top two guys, where he's gonna play yeah. make a little bit, he's gonna score a little bit, not gonna be that big body, but I think that that first line too, if that's if that's the line they're going with, I think that line could put up some points too. 
And I'm hoping yeah. that they, I know Connor and Shifley obviously have chemistry. I know they passed back to one another both at times last year. Each one of them were feeding one another. If you can add Velarde to that line to be more of a defensive player with two guys who don't really play defense, I think that's a bonus for the Jets. Yeah. And Connor and Shifley, we know they work together offensively. It's the, the defensive end that doesn't really work uh, with those two paired together, whether it's Wheeler, whether it's Ehlers, whether whoever you put on that right wing, it doesn't really, they, they give up a lot of chances, but yeah. Gabriel Velarde's defensive metrics last year were great. And that might've been inflated by a King's system that in, seems to inflate everyone's defensive metrics. But uh, if, if anyone's going to, mitigate that and still provide enough offense for that line to be a top line uh it's it's gabriel velarde and yeah like uh, all the things you said about perfetti i i agree i i i'm really excited to see him at center obviously he was drafted to be a center that was kevin shovel day off's quote at the draft uh it's going to be it's going to be very interesting but outside of that um we did cover training camp last week so mm-hmm. go check that out uh episode 45 and let's get into some season predictions. Some we did this lot. We did we didn't have the you know preseason last year when we mm-hmm. were doing this podcast. We started in the middle of the year. We did some mid season awards, um, but now this year we can do it's predictions mid season and then reflect on it all at the end of the year. Um, so let's let's start with just a simple where the Jets are going to finish in the standings. I see a lot of people starting to post their standing predictions to Twitter. Yeah. It's that time of the year, uh, predicting which teams are in, which teams are out. So where do you think the Jets end the year uh, in the Central Division and the Western Conference? I think it's somewhere in between the third and fourth place in the Central. Yeah, I think they either get the last of it. Like I, when I say I, they're going to get the last division spot, I think I mean they're the last to clinch a division spot or they're the last to clinch a wild card spot. Like, I think it comes down to game 79 and it's okay. Well, if you want to make the playoffs, you're going to beat this team. You got to hope so-and-so loses and the Jets like win the game. Like, I think their last, their second, like even this, it's game 81 and they got to play Seattle and it's like, okay, well, you got to beat Seattle and you got to hope that so-and-so in the Pacific loses and the Jets win 2-1 in overtime at home. And they make it way too close. And the other game is like a blowout or something where it's like, Hey, you've been given this opportunity to just like all you, the, the, the other team that you were going to be fighting for a playoff spot got rolled. All you have to do is let's yeah. say secure two points. And they, as the jets always do, they make it way closer than it needs to be. <laughs> and they, somebody becomes the hero and yay, they made the playoffs. I think we got too trigger happy last year about, I mean, and granted, the team looked so good towards the middle of the year last year. We were very, um, we were very adamant about them being the top team in the central and this and that. And obviously, they completely right. fell off again. Um, I'm going to temper my expectations once again, and still, st- I'm going to stick with where I thought they'd be last year, third or fourth in the division. I think they sneak yeah. into the playoffs. I think they're a fringe playoff team. Yeah, I mean, I do agree with you on the fringe playoff team at the end of the year. Uh, last year when they were, you know, first in the West, um, they were like going on the road and beating teams. They Colorado came into their building and they stomped them like five, one. I, I definitely stand by those takes from December last year when the jets were flying at first in the West and they just like blew out uh, four straight teams on a home stand. It was like, my eyes were telling me that is the best team in the yep. West at this time. And then we know what happened. They they fell off a cliff. But the thing is, they're, when they fell off a cliff, the, that two-month stretch, it was a like an unbelievably unchar- uncharacteristic PDO slump. So they their shooting percentage, their save percentage, their expected goals, like they were generating the same amount that they were when they were the best team in the West. They just weren't finishing them. And it was really, really weird because it seemed like the effort just wasn't there uh, and all that stuff. But and and maybe it was, you know, maybe 
maybe the effort wasn't there. We we probably said that in that stretch. But mm-hmm. if you look at the the analytics and just don't even watch the game, you just look at a a, a mathematical equation. They yeah. were generating the same amount, giving up the same amount down the stretch. Uh, and then at the end of the year, the reason I think two or maybe all three of us picked them to beat Vegas in the first round was because the the last 10 games, they went back to that that best team in the West and mm-hmm. that we saw and they were killing teams on that on their homestand. So I I don't know what happened in those two months. Uh, that's like one of the craziest shooting slumps I've ever seen from a team. And I don't know, maybe that'll happen again this year because maybe they're lacking some shooting talent, but Nino and Velarde will definitely help that. I think Colorado and Dallas are locked one and two in the central yeah. teams are absolutely loaded. And then for the three spot, it's between the jets and the wilds. And then whichever team is, is not is I, I think is a wild card team. So the yeah. Jets might be a wild card team, um, but yeah, I, I agree with everything you said on the 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 fringe playoff team. Uh, I I don't know. I it's going to be interesting. It's hard because... to say anything different. Like, and I, I'm not trying to say that I'm taking back my takes from last year, but I'm just saying that I don't think I want to jump to conclusions. To yes, I know they looked like the best team in the West, and I will still stand by that take. It's just. I don't know if I want to do that again this year if they're in the same position. Right. Because Yeah, no, that's that's fair. This is the exa- this is essentially the exact same team minus Pierre-Luc Dubois and add Gabe Velarde and Ajax Alafalo. Like this is the exact same team. So yeah. unless Velarde and Ayafalo combine for more points or the whatever you want to say if you want to do the whole money ball thing, we're replacing one guy <laughs> and bringing in so like Rasmus yeah. Kipar, yeah, we're losing one but we're bringing in three to Add up, like if we want to do that whole thing, but we at gotta the end, replace <laughs> Jason Giambi in the in the afterlife or whatever. Yeah, but, whatever he says. Yeah, he gets on base. What's the what's the NHL equivalent of he gets on base? I don't, I don't even know. We'd have to think about that. <laughs> maybe maybe we can come back next episode and say what that uh, yeah what that reference is. But yeah, well, I mean, if it's the Jets, it's um, I don't even know. I was trying to make a I was trying to make a joke in terms of things that they're all worried about in the same organization, but it doesn't really work. Anywho, um, yeah, I I just think that this team is a last division spot fringe playoff team. Like, well, you the rest up- of Central is weak, so they should be a playoff mm-hmm. team. But I can yeah. also see them trying to figure things out early on, and they struggle early, and we're like sixth or seventh in the West, and we're chasing the rest of the year. Right, like I actually think having a good start with this roster is the most important thing. Like being in and yeah. around the playoff race to begin with, before anything is like okay, now we're chasing playoff. Like needs to be that they are starting off good. And I, this beginning of the schedule is not like the first couple of games aren't the easiest either. Right, like Florida is your reigning runner up. You've got LA coming to town in game three. Like you, you, you yeah. got to pull away a, at least two, two wins. I would think. Yeah. The first couple and games. So we, you brought up Velarde, I follow and Kapari. And I want to get into your expectations for those guys. We're definitely going to talk about the start of season later in the episode, because I think that is like the first 25 games of the season. I think are, is like the season because We'll, we'll get into it. I, I, I want to save my take for later, but um, yeah. let's talk about Velarde, Ayafalo, and Kapari. Um, just some expectations for those guys. I'll go first with, with Velarde. I think last year, if you he missed some time, he only played 63 games or something. If you take that, the amount that he scored over 82 games, he had something like 30 goals, 23 assists, or 24 assists, something like that, uh, over an 82 game pace. And that's that's great if the Jets are getting that on their top line with great defensive metrics. So those are exactly what my expectations are for him this year. It's 30 goals, 25 assists, strong defensive metrics on that top line. Um, I'm not expecting him to take another jump forward. Like he broke out last year. If he continues that steep ascension and goes to like 40 goals, then wow, that's like insane. And the Jets flee. They, the they, yeah, they, they, yeah, they, yeah, they win the trade outright. Like it's not even... Yeah. But if 
uh, re- reasonable expectation, I think, is 30 goals, 25 assists, um, just kind of doing what he did last year in a bigger role, uh, maybe on the top power play. I don't know how that is all going to shake out. But, yeah, what are your expectations for Velarde? I think that if you – or if he's in and around like 55, 60 points, like I think if he hits the 60 mm-hmm. point mark, I think it's a good year. If he's in around 50 to 55, I think that's, and, and he plays good defensively. Like that is right. my, my interpretation of him having a good season is all predicated on him continuing those defensive metrics that he had last year. If he puts up yeah. 55 points and he still, and he's goes back to, or goes to being not good defensively, then I kind of go, I don't think that's great. Because you had you had that, in, I know PLD didn't want to stay, but you had that in PLD. Like he was a right. lock for sixty points every year, right? Like he's right. a fifty-five, sixty-point guy. But if you get defensive metrics plus that similar point total, I, th- I think you, I think you win that. I think they, the Jets win that trade, and I think that I feel better about Filardi's season. Like he doesn't even yeah. have to put up thirty goals. If it's more assists than goals, if it's twenty-five and. 35 i know that probably doesn't i think that equals 60 but i my quick math isn't great but (laughs) either way i think that if you have it so that he is in around the 50 to 55 point range plays good defense shows that he is good to like be the defensive anchor on the line i think i think that the jets are just fine and i think you're you're happy with however the season ends for the jets i think you're happy with velarde's season and hopefully he doesn't miss time either like right. it, that that's the other caveat. If he's missed, if he misses time, but he's still on that 50 to 50, like 55 around Mark that he was last year, like on pace for that, then I mm-hmm. would still say that's a successful season. Cause I, yeah. I, I hate being that guy of like, like you look at Nikolai Ehlers last year, people will say, well, he didn't have a great year. Cause he got injured. Well, no, when he was out there on the ice, he looked great. So you can't right. like, I always go by if, if somebody's on pace for something, and I know that's not indicative of what it would have been, but if he's on right. pace for that and he's playing well when he's healthy, then I think that is that's perfectly perfectly fine. Yeah, I I agree with you there, um, Alex. I have follow. I actually don't think we have to talk about him because I was writing an article the other day and searched this up. But in the past five seasons, he scored between thirteen and seventeen goals, between thirty three and forty three points uh, every single year. So he's just been in that frame every single year for the past five years. He's a great penalty killer. He's going to be great defensively. There's no expectations for Alex I follow because that, that's what he is. That's what he's going to be every single year. Um, yeah. So we don't even really have to talk about him. He's going to be a great middle six addition to this team. Um, I just want to say that um, he is one of my favorite defensive players. Like just, I know he's not like everybody's top defensive forward, but he is one of my favorite depth defensive forwards. Like I, I love him. I'm so glad the Jets picked him up. I'm just a fan of his. So I will probably, whenever he plays well, I will probably praise him for that because I know he's not really going to get that anywhere else. Yeah. So I, 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 I think that was a very when I read when we initially read the trade, I was very happy to see that the Jets brought him in because then at least you're bringing in a defensive forward that puts up points. Yeah, the Jets have too many defensive forwards that don't put up points. Mm-hmm. Like in a league where you need to be putting up points, like this isn't the like two thousand late nineties, early two thousands, where we've got goaltending duos and the game, lots of games end one nothing anymore. Like you, you need to you for for you to keep a spot in the NHL, you need to be able to put up points. You have to have mm-hmm. some sort of skill. So for him to put up around forty points, be a fifteen goal scorer. Maybe even if he's on a good line this year with good chem, with a couple other guys that can create, maybe he puts up 20 goals. I think if he gets to 20 goals, I think that's a gr- fantastic season. And I think yeah. just should be very proud of the pickup. Yeah. And Rasmus Kapari, um, again, I don't think we have to talk about him. If he if he's able to win the fourth line role, I think that's a success. And he's able to just maintain that role throughout the course of the year, look good in it. Um, because he's there's no room for him any higher in the lineup. Even if even if a top six player goes down, it's not Rasmus Kapari who's coming up. It's Alex I follow from the third line. It's Vladislav Nemesikov from the third or fourth line. It's Chaz Lucius from the AHL. It's Brad Lambert from the AHL. It's not. I don't think it's Kapari. No. So there's there shouldn't really be any expectations for him because 
he might just be the fourth line center the whole year, and that's that. Well, I hope that he has a good year. Like he's still a young player. He's still got some potential. He's still got But like some... what's the what's the ceiling? Like six goals, twelve assists, eighteen points. If he's the fourth line center the whole year, like that's the absolute best case scenario, I think. Well, I think if he gets closer to double digits, like like I think if he goes close to double digits and, and you know that the fourth line gets time and bonus assist him, right? Like True. Bones like to roll his fourth line. This isn't a team where he doesn't True. roll a fourth line because he feels like it's weak. He'll True. roll a fourth line because he feels like that, that line is defensive. And th- I, I actually have to say, I think as much as this team is essentially the exact same team, this team has more depth, I would say. They've got oh, a year definitely. of guys. Yeah. So this team has got a year of growth. So for me, if Kupari can be a – we've heard that he's a big body. If he can be a penalty killer, if he can be a – if he wins his face off, if I hate saying that, but if he wins his face-offs, is a good penalty killer, and he puts up around 20 points, I th- I, like 10, a goal, 10 goals, 10 assists, or 8 goals, 12 assists, I think you're really happy about, about that. And – I mean, if he if he goes off and is playing well, because I I don't even know who that fourth line is going to be, right? Like yeah. that could be Baron and who else would that be? Nemestikov potentially, depending could on be. how yeah. the lines. Like it could yeah. be Ayafalo, right? And that's more of an offensive player, right? That'd be a very ultra pretty good defensive fourth line if you've got like yeah. Baron I don't think Ayafalo like, slides down. I, I don't think he slides but, to the four, yeah. but I'm just saying, right? Like. If you have Kupari on the line with like Baron and somebody else on the right wing, I I think you're I think that line could be pretty decent. Like we saw we saw what guys like Adam Lowry and Morgan Barron were doing on the fourth line at times last year when Lowry got yeah. moved down. Like they they were generating chances. And we know Baron yeah. has Baron just needs to finish, right? So Kupari yeah. can get a bunch of assists from Baron just actually being able to find the back of the net this year, too. Yeah. Right? That's true. So, yeah. You, you never know. I, I, I'm not trying to say that he's going to put up, he's going to have a fantastic year and he's going to put up 40 points and they're going to move him up the lineup. But if he has development, I, I can't not see him. Maybe if he has a good year being the third line center next year, maybe if, yeah, if, he, I if, mean, he has a, if he has a good year, if he doesn't, I think as a prospect, you kind of know what you're getting from him. But if he has some sort of growth, because people have said that he still has some room to grow. Yeah. I, I think he's a bottom, he's a bottom six center. Or a bottom six forward because he can play on both the left and right wing, depending on where he plays. But I think that that's kind of his ceiling. I don't think you're seeing what we thought when he was drafted being a potentially like a middle six forward. Yeah. He's a bottom six forward. But if you can have a good bottom six forward on your team, I don't think you're complaining at all if you're the Jets. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I do agree with that. I think Bonus will use the fourth line more than he ever has. Because the be- the fourth line will be better than the Jets have had in the last five years. Um, enough of the fourth line talk. It's time to get to the stars. <laughs> Play the hits. Who's your team MVP, Elliot, for the 2023-24 season? So you could be really generic and say like Josh Morrissey. Now, well, that's we my think- pick. <laughs> that's your pick? Okay. <laughs> you could be very generic and say it's like Mark Shifley in his swan song here in mm. Winnipeg, and he has that huge, massive year, and da 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 da. You could also just be very generic and say Cal Connor, and I think Cal Connor has a bounce back year. Yeah. So I I, I don't think it's it's between those three. It's between. Morrissey. I think Hellebuck too. If yeah, Hellebuck if, is in yeah. yes. Hellebuck but, as well, I, if he's staying the year, right? We we don't know yeah. with Shafley and Hellebuck if they're even going to last the whole year. But for the first half of the season or however many games these guys might play with the team, Hellebuck, if he, he could be the team MVP uh, through the first 40 games, playing amazing. And then some team yeah. trades for him and he goes on and wins the Stanley Cup. But who knows? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, but my pick is Josh Morrissey. Um, I think he's going to be the team MVP this year. He put up 76 points in 78 games last year. And I've said it before. He's a regression candidate, but that doesn't mean he's going to go back to like 30 points a season. Right. I think he regresses to 60. Yeah. He might dip down to 50 in that 50 to 65 range. Uh, but a point per game, I don't think is something that he's going to repeat or is sustainable. His shooting percentage went up like 4% last year. It's usually at 6%. It was at like 9 So I think that's going to come down a little bit. 
Um, he's still going to get top power play minutes. He's still going to play 27 minutes a night, which is why I'm picking him to be the team MVP because he's going to get every opportunity to do so. We saw how talented he was last year. Yeah, He's still going to put up a boatload of points. I just don't know if it'll be a point per game. He mm-hmm. absolutely has the talent to do it. I'm not, yeah. I'm not disputing that. I'm just saying sometimes hockey is just pure luck and shooting percentage is just regression to the mean up and down. And he might, experience it the opposite way this year and mm-hmm. not when that shot hits the post it might go out instead of in a f- like two or three times and that knocks off yeah. three goals from his his total at the end of the year. Oh, you know, no. it's it's hockey's weird sometimes so i just think it's it's he's it, i'm picking him to be my team mvp like i don't think he's gonna have a bad year he's gonna be the best jet i think yeah but i think he dips down to the 60 55 point range i am going to say that um, I'm going to agree with you and say that Morrissey is around the 60, 65 point range. Like he's about 10, 15 points off of what he was last year. Mm-hmm. I am going to make a prediction. If you're making points predictions, cause I didn't say it with Cal Connor. If everything works out, right. Let's say Shifley stays. And let's say Velarde works as more of a passer. Cal Connor might be in for a 40, another 40 goal year. I I'm, so. gonna, I, I, I'm I gonna say I'm going to make a prediction right now and say it's 45. And you can come back to this if I'm 45. wrong. I'm wrong. Ooh. I'm going to make an exact prediction and say 45. And he's on. I know he probably won't lead the league in goals, but I will say that he will be on pace for much of the year to be in that conversation. And he will go yeah. back to Kyle. Con- he had too many opportunities last year that just weird, fluky. Things where a goalie would come cross crease and make a save. He'd hit a post. He'd miss an open net. Like there was just yeah. too much. And you know, at the professional level, how guys are when things don't go their way with luck, right. they train harder. They work on those things and they make sure that those luck based things don't happen enough. Don't happen as much because then they're worried about they're using their skill to make sure it happens. Right. If you kind of get and- what I'm doing. Or saying yeah I no i i i understand i mean i i agree with you this is this is the the shooting regression podcast now it's not the level flight anymore <laughs> but if you want to talk about shooting shooting percentage regression N- morrissey is gonna is likely going to come down cal Carnes is likely gonna come up he has been i think it was like 15 percent his whole career i'd have to double check this i just mm-hmm. wrote it but he's been around 15 percent his whole career last year dipped down to 11 or something Again, for the past five seasons, he's been at 15% and it dipped down to 11. It's yeah. going to come back up. Like it's going to be back at 15. And with Shifley, with Velarde, with top power play minutes, I can totally see him hitting 40 or, or, yeah. Or this year. I, so I think I he agree. goes off for a nuts, like just absolutely insane point total. I'm just trying yeah. to look at it now because I'm trying to find shooting percentage. He's, he's a career average 14.5. So in his okay. year that he put up 47 goals the year before, 14.8 mm-hmm. the year before, where he only played 56 games, 15.7, 15.9 in the games se- in the season in 1920. I don't know why it's bolded. Normally bolded on um hockey reference means that it's the most he's played, but he played his most games last year. Uh 15.9. 15 in 18 19 and then in the cup run year in seven was that 17 18 yeah uh 16.1 percent last year was 11.4 percent and he still put up 31 goals and still like put that's up coming goals. back up that's coming back up he's he's oh. getting to 40 goals this year and well what did I, he have I, through the first yeah. like 10 15 games he had like three goals he had like one or two no he had like one oh, it was goal a one or two yeah in the, in and the it was first an empty net 13 games yeah and it was an empty netter right in the in the very first game i think or one of the one of the early games it was an empty netter yeah so it was like cal connor has not beat a goalie yet and we were like 13 games into the season it was it was ridiculous but yeah, he's that that number is absolutely coming back up and he's going to I think he's going to get to 40. I agree with you. Yeah, there. I, I don't see how he doesn't like he still put up 80. He had more assists last year. He had almost 50 assists. Yeah, right. But that was also him assisting another 40 goal scorer on the line and Mark Shifley. Right. Yeah. So if you can have it where Shifley still puts up, let's say he stays and still puts up th- in around 30 goals and you have Kyle Connor who puts up. 40 something well then what does that do for uh, gabe velardi's point totals 
right? right. Yeah, that, you could see like that the, go way, his assist total could go way up. He could just skyrocket. Maybe his goal total goes down a little bit because he's not the offensive focal point because he's got two other guys. But his assist yeah. total might just absolutely skyrocket. But yeah. either way, I think that line will have another close to, if not 40 goal scorer. Yeah. As long as if, let's say, Kyle Connor obviously is on pace for that or Shifley stays. Right. So. Yeah. Right. Let's let's move on to the most improved player, the breakout pick. We might have the exact same one because I think it's pretty obvious, but my answer is Cole Perfetti. Uh, if he gets that second line center role, we said all the things we said earlier about him and Ehlers working well together. I think he's in for a huge season assist assist total wise. And just seeing his development at center is going to be something to monitor over the course of the year. But is yours Perfetti or do you have a different one? So are we doing improved and breakout the same? Yeah. Or are they different? Like okay. that, that's kind of so the same. Yeah. I'm going to do it a little bit differently. Okay. I think Perfetti is the most improved player okay. on the roster. He was my most improved player last year. You know where I'm going with this. I know you're where I will be on the train it. until it dies. I will <laughs> say that he looked so good last year in the last 10 games. He also got unlucky towards the end of the year. He should have had more yeah. goals and more points than he should have. I'm going a breakout season, especially if he plays on that third line. I say breakout season for Morgan Barron. I think he has Very a year. I, the, I think he has a year where he puts up 40, 40, 45 points. 45 points from Morgan Barron. Who? That's All right. Well, steamy. so let's and, and you know what? If that's a steamy take, then that's a steamy take. So let's Last go. Last year he had twenty one. He had eight goals, thirteen assists, twenty one points in seventy games. So you could probably add like five more to that, or not not even like three more to that if he plays. Uh, if he plays well, every so game, so he was playing for well, yeah. If he, he, like he's maybe a thirty point guy, which is still actually pretty good for a guy who plays fourth line, like close yeah. to thirty points, but. You look at his shooting percentage. It's at 7.1. You also have to factor in those last. I, I know he's not a great finisher, but there that's were some times thing. where he should have finished finished a couple. And I'm hoping that that's what he worked on this offseason. Yeah. The thing is, I like, also the think shooting that percentage has a, might, go, might go out the window for guys that just struggle with finishing around yeah. the net. But I so. think that goes. I I think he has an out. He may have an outlier year this year. He is not. He is how old? He is twenty four. He has not had a quote unquote outlier year yet in his career. Yeah, I know some guys don't, but some guys do, right? And he has shown that at the AHL level. He's shown it at the NHL yeah. level. Him and Adam Lowry were generating chances galore. Yeah, towards the end of the year and in the playoffs. Right. Okay. If you get that version of Morgan, if you if realistically, if you get that version of Morgan Barron and have that over a seventy to eighty two game pace, I don't see why thirty high thirties, close to forty points is out of the question. Because yeah. there were a couple I mean, times where he should have finished and he missed. So I know Kyle Connor. I know we just talked about that with Kyle Connor, and he's a different story because he's an elite goal scorer. Right. But we did talk about luck. Right. He might get some lucky. guys. Might some guys lucky. might some some at some point a player has to have. I know this is being a little bit superstitious, but at some point some guys have to have an outlier season, right? Yeah. And someone like Baron hasn't had an outlier season. I mean, if he turns into be an Alex Iafalo where he's just the same for his entire career, then that's great. Right. But most guys at some point have to have any at least an outlier or somewhat outlying season that didn't really make much sense, and then you go back and watch and go, oh well. You know, right? So, yeah. Well, if that, you look that, at that's my yeah. pick. Okay. If you look at like traditional aging curves and when guys have those breakout outlier seasons, this would be the time for Baron um, because he's played a couple years now. He's 24. Uh, he's kind of in the middle of his prime. If you look at, like I said, traditional aging curves, this is this is it. So, um, I, 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 I love it. I love the bold takes. Um, I do. Before we get Jacob in here, I do want to talk last about where this team sits at the trade deadline with Hellebuck and Shifley. And mm. this is the take that I was going to say earlier, but I, I saved. I think the first 25 to 30-ish games 
are the season. If the Jets stumble out of the gate uh, and they do nothing to convince Shifley and Hellebuck to stay, then those guys are going to not sign extensions, right? Obviously, they're going to want out. They're going to want to play for a winner. Uh, and the Jets are sixth, seventh in the central. And they're like, well, screw this. I, I don't want to waste um, the prime of my career on a team that's sixth in the central or whatever. Um, I'm not saying they're going to be sixth in the central, but yeah, just in, not, yeah, say they're first in the central after 25 games. They're first and they got a four point gap on second place in Colorado and Dallas. And it's like, well, they're in the mix. So and then Shifley and Hubbuck might be like, you know what? It isn't so bad here in Winnipeg. Let's. Let's sign an extension for another year. Kick the can down the road or three, four years. I, I, I think the first 30 games is incredibly important if you're trying to keep Shifley and Hellebuck around because I think that's when their decision is going to be made. Now, at the trade deadline, I, I think the Jets are going to be a top three team in the Central and they're going to be faced with this dilemma, especially if these players don't have extensions. But my take is that the first 30 games will decide uh, whether or not those guys are going to want to either just sign a one-year deal and like f- go through this entire situation next year or sign a, a long extension and stay with the Jets long-term for their entire career, right? So yeah, I think, I think the first 30 games are key. I agree. I think it's if they're not doing well, we'll see. Oh, Connor Hellebuck has requested a trade. Oh, Mark Shifley has now requested a trade, right? <laughs> if, they're, if they're in... Right. Well, because they're not going to sign the extension. And you, the Jets have sort of turned this around where they've been actually not too bad at asset management, where if they're not going to be able to keep somebody, they've actually been on... You look at PLD. We thought he was just going to walk. They weren't going to tender. They weren't going to do anything. He was just going to walk, Right. Right. Or he was just going to sit and then they were going to get absolutely nothing for him. And they've made that trade into a very good, they turned PLD into a very good trade. Not what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. I think the first, like you said, 30 games are key. And I don't think any, either one of them signed an extension longer than a year. I, Mm -hmm. I, I I don't see that. I see, I see until let's say, I don't know. Let's say a bunch of prospects break out. Like Lucius has a great year with the moose and Brad Lambert has a good year with the moose and a bunch of other guys start to break out Mm -hmm. in terms of the forward core. And maybe they bring in a, maybe they make a trade for a defenseman, a younger defenseman or this or that. And they make a couple other moves. I don't think these guys will sign long-term. If, if it's just the same roster every single year, these guys are going to say, well, I'm just going to keep signing one years because at some point I'm going to need to be traded. And Shifley and Hellebuck are going to be on TSN's t- uh, watch list for trades for the next couple years until that happens, until it's, oh, okay, well, none of the prospects have blossomed like we hoped, and now we're left with just this roster. Yeah. And, so that the guys, and then those two will say, you know what? Nope, that, that's it for me, right? Yeah. So this whole... Connor Hellebuck's going to sign like a three-year extension or a two-year. No, I think it's if he's staying, it's they're just going to keep signing one-year deals until they've they've decided that they no longer they really no longer want to be here. And whether that be performance yeah. or they see roster construction or they look at the prospects and go, oh, Locius didn't hit, Barlow didn't hit, so and so like right, and you start getting yeah. to the point where nobody's breaking out, right? So. Yeah, I, I, can, I, I, I can definitely see yeah. that. Yeah. So yeah. we'll see how we'll see how they are at the trade deadline. If they're in the, around the top three, then I think those guys stay. And maybe at that point they sign extensions. Maybe they're still on the trade bait list and then they sign the extensions and then they're off. Right. But to me, I think that in terms of like if they're sniffing the playoffs, personally for me, and I know I'm I know I'm not a general manager, but for if it were me, if I'm only sniffing in and around the playoffs, like I'm fourth, fifth, or I don't really have a mm. secure playoff spot, I'm offloading them immediately, even if they don't request yeah. a trade. Because the last thing I need is to miss the playoffs. They say, nope, we're not staying, and then you get nothing for them. Right? But if they're in the yeah. t- like you said, if they're in the top three and they're or they're in fourth and they're securely in fourth, and whoever's in fifth is like the rest of the central is what we ho- expect it to be to be bottom of the league and they're they're just fighting the other division for a like for the other wild card spot then i think that 
then those guys might stay and they might sign a one-year extension just to see if maybe they add a piece at the deadline. Maybe they, because we didn't even talk about this and we'll talk about this probably next week or when it gets close to the season, but this decor needs to be redone. Yeah, we'll see, we'll see how that how that looks in training camp, what battles, like there, there are so many battles on, on the defense score as well. And that's something I'm going to talk about with Jacob in a second here. Um, we should cut this part, get to Jacob. Um, I mean, we're going to hear I, th- I'll cut this. Hold on. We're going to get to Jacob in a second here. Uh, first, we're going to hear a word from our sponsors, DraftKings. Um, Brian is not here, but he's still gracious enough to send the ad. So he's, you're going to hear Brian for a bit. And then we're going to come back with Jacob Stoller from the hockey news. So stay tuned. We're back with another week of football and DraftKings Sportsbook is keeping us in on the NFL action with great offers every single game day. New customers can bet $5 and get $200 instantly in bonus bets. Throw five down on any of this week's epic matchups to walk away with an instant winner. And DraftKings isn't stopping there. All customers can take advantage of two new offers every game this September. Football's more fun when you're in on the action. So download the app now and sign up with code THPN. New customers can bet just $5 and get $200 instantly in bonus bets. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL with code THPN. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY or 467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-QUADRUPLE-7 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino Resort in Kansas, 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction, void in Ontario, see dkng.co slash football for eligibility. Terms and responsible gaming resources uh, are there for your availability. Uh, Bonus bets expire seven days after issuance. Eligibility and deposit restrictions apply. And welcome back into episode 46 of the Level Flight Podcast. I have a very special guest joining me, Jacob Stoller of the Hockey News and Yahoo Sports. He let me know beforehand, not to forget Yahoo, new gig. Um, Jacob, just say a little bit about yourself. You've been on the podcast before, but for new listeners. Yeah, clearly I scared away Brian and Elliot. Uh, I didn't realize <laughs> I was I was that harsh last time. But uh, yeah. yeah, I'm a born and raised Winnipegger who was in Toronto the last couple of years, back in Winnipeg uh, for now. I covered the NHL for the hockey news um, and Yahoo. And then I also, um, you know, write about some AHL stuff uh, for the hockey news and in the magazine. Uh, I host an AHL podcast, East AHL podcast, an American pipeline podcast, a lot of podcasts these days, as you can tell. (laughs) Um, But yeah, super psyched to uh, talk jets with you, man. Yeah. Everyone's got to follow Jacob on Twitter. He's got his handle. If you're on YouTube right there so that you can keep up with all those podcasts, right? Exactly. You also forgot to mention that uh, uh, with all those accomplishments, you also have a sick jersey background. I do. Uh, that, they're like, actually like all I've... they're all from China. Um, oh, really? A lot of them. <laughs> the, the Oilers, Taylor Hall, or the Oilers, Taylor Hall, and then the yeah. Crosby one are my favorites. And my uncle was doing work in in China, and he just kind of saw these on the street for like five bucks. And uh, so those are sweet. Yeah. And then um, my my girlfriend's uh, brother in law gave me the. Pat Falloon jersey here. Uh wow. yeah, it's been it's been uh it's been pretty awesome, I gotta say. <laughs> that is pretty awesome. I mean, five bucks for a I mean yeah. it's got the C on it, it's got the it's patch on sick. it. Like I know that's I legit. It. Yeah, it's legit. That is legit. All right, let's get into some jets. Um sure, man. we we previewed training camp last week, but we wanted to bring someone on for you know a different perspective on all the, the sure. storylines following this team. I think personally, the biggest storyline is the second line center. Mm-hmm. Um, the totally. groupings, the groupings would suggest that Cole Perfetti is the guy that's going to get the first look. Where do you kind of lean? Like, where would your personal preference be in terms of Perfetti versus Velarde versus Nemesnikov? Yeah, yeah. And do you think Perfetti's the best setup for success this season in that role? Yeah. Like, I think that originally I kind of thought, okay, long term, you know, I think that they'd like to have Perfetti as a center. I think the mm-hmm. questions with him are obviously the skating durability and, you know, his hockey sense and passing is elite as it is right now. But yeah. those other, those other factors obviously come into play. 
but long term, I think they'd like to have him as a center. So um, it makes sense. I kind of thought that maybe Velarde would start as center, but just out of the fact that he's played a bit. But I think Velarde's probably a better winger, and and, and I, I think that that's kind of a attachment to this. Then again, he could become the center, uh, a center at points this year, let alone maybe next year if if Mark Scheifele isn't back. So that option is still there. Um, I think it's going to be really interesting to see how training camp progresses in that regard. And I think there's a couple people I like to see Perfetti play with to get a, a read of, mm-hmm. of how it could be. Because something that I've kind of learned from talking to people over the years is, and the, you know, I played hockey growing up, but not at a high level. I played like A3. <laughs> Um, if people so, which people in Manitoba would know, like I was brutal. Um, <laughs> but what I've learned from people around the game is like, you know, a center there could be warts in their defensive game, but if you have a certain winger that is can really support them defensively, it can make a huge difference. And I think that Alex Iafalo is could be that guy for Perfetti. I think AI is a criminally underrated uh player when looking at the Jets' depth chart because I think that a lot of projections have had Nino in the top six. And I think I follow actually could be in that top six to support a Perfetti. So and I'm sure we'll get into that. But in short, I think Perfetti probably makes a lot of sense to try. That's where they want him to be long term. So right. that probably makes the most sense in that regard. Yeah, I wrote a bunch to, to your earlier point. I wrote a bunch this summer about how Velarde was the safer bet. Yeah. Be center because he's 6'3", 215 pounds. He's played center before at the mm-hmm. NHL level. All of those things Perfetti is not. He's smaller. He hasn't played sure. center at the NHL level yet. Um, but I agree with you. I think he's the high upside swing. The the long term outlook is. I think they want Perfetti to be a center, mm-hmm. and now's the time. I mean, there's yeah, a huge yeah. hole at, at second line center, so now's the time to try him out. Um, and if you can't do line, it, you move him. Yeah, exactly. And you yeah. put Velarde there. Yeah, totally. it's it's or Nemestikov, as you said, for sure. Exactly. And speaking of Nemestikov, yeah, fourth line center is also a pretty big question mark. I mean, there's Kapari, there's David Gustafson, there's uh, in the Mesikov, if they want to, you know, yeah. be deep down the middle, um, mm-hmm. that's kind of a, a smaller storyline, but sticking with the centers, where do sure. you see the fourth line center battle? It's a great question. There's a lot of unknowns. Um, curious yeah. to know what you think too, but in my opinion, okay. So it depends on a couple of things. Um, history would tell us that not even just Maurice, but bones too. like the fourth line, the fourth line is going to be the fourth line. Right. And that's not mm-hmm. even just, I think with the Jets, aside from the Kraken, most teams' fourth line is a very clear fourth line. So by mm-hmm. that token, I think that Nemesnikov, at least what he showed, is too valuable to be relegated to that role. And I think that he could fit like a glove alongside Adam Lowry. And I think, you know, Barron played yeah. great with him. It could be a rotation of those two. I don't know. Um, but I would say that perhaps, like, it, it very well could happen, but I'm interested to see how David Gustafson does this year. I think mm-hmm. that stylistically he fits every mold you want in a fourth line center. Last year was was a really, really tough and, and strange year from him. Um, I think that, you know, there's always been concerns about his, his ability to play with pace and his foot speed and stuff. But I don't know. I just expected more from him. I thought I remembered the first game against New York when uh, Gagne scored that goal. Uh, it was a game winner, right? It was a big goal, wasn't it? Against the Rangers? Rangers? Yeah. yeah. Big... Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. So yeah. that line, that night, I remember Gustafson looked good. Um, yeah. Things didn't go that way as the year progressed. He wasn't a regular. So you got to take that into account. But I think he would fit more what you'd want in the fourth line center than a Kupari. He's an unknown, though, Rasmus yeah. Kupari. I think that, um, you know, you hope that a former first-round pick can maybe revitalize their game or whatnot and be in – a top man role. I think it's a bit ambitious given the jet, the options the jets have and just kind of how Kupari's career is, you know, unfolded to this date. But I think that Gustafson will be given a lot of looks there down the middle. Um, you know, if you have a fourth line, if you, you know, I think optimally I would agree with maybe Nemesco go on your fourth line and then evening out mm-hmm. the lines. But I think when you're looking at the personnel, the third line is going to have Adam Lowry. And then one yeah. of I follow or Nino, right? Everyone right. thinks it's going to be I follow, could be, but I, I think people it could be Nino. Okay, right. So if that's the case, those guys are going to get big minutes. So that third line can be kind of relied on as a quote unquote shutdown line or whatever. I think Mestikov can fill that gap really well, and maybe even give mm-hmm. some offensive upside. So um, 
that's why I think he'll be there. And the fourth line center is kind of ruled out for him. Yeah. But um, yeah, I, I think optimally it'd be nice to have him as a fourth line center to have four even lines, but it's not realistic. Yeah. I, I think going to Mesikov as four C is like the right idea. And when the jets are winning games, when they're up to nothing in the Rick bonus system, they want to keep it two one two nothing. Right. Hmm. I think when they're up to nothing, optimally like you said they're running four lines and Nemesikov is just an extension of the third line uh being another shutdown role Um, yeah and I I think Bones is really set on Lowry and Appleton yeah playing together on that third line they've done it last year the whole time it didn't really work at like analytically it didn't really work but he still rolled with it I think he's gonna roll with it again I think it'll be Nino Lowry Appleton and then the fourth line will be, I guess, Bear and Nemesikov, and maybe Kapari will slide to the wing or Nemesikov will be on the wing because he can and that's play fine. As like well. if that's if that's the right. case, like that's fine. Um yeah, that's interesting. I think you make a good point there. Yeah, and then when when the Jets are losing, obviously the, the fourth line's minutes are gonna be cut uh, and you're gonna roll the top six trying to get back into the game. But the way the Jets want to play and the Rick and the way Rick Bonus has genuine genera- generally played. In yeah. his in the past is rolling four lines and having shut yeah. down bottom six right well it's like optimally it's like imagine if you had a fourth line of lowry baron appleton and then your third line of nemestikov nino and right another player like that's right maybe that's see, that's a conversation i'm here for yeah like, because see, that, that's, that's a yeah. bit of a forward approach um right. but i think realistically Lowry's a three C and I want to make it clear. I, I'm a big fan of Adam Lowry's game. I think there's a mm-hmm. lot of, of un sorry, like um, how do I say this kind of unfounded criticism in his game. And I think that like, I listen, I'm a big analytic junkie. I know you like the numbers too. Like I, mm-hmm. like, I make AHL player cards for God's sake. It's like, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm big on the numbers, but you got to yeah. really evaluate the full body of work. And Adam Lowry's a great third line center. So I just want to make that clear in my opinion. Yeah, and a lot of people bring up the the long goal drought last year, the forty or thirty two. I, I forget what the number was, but he went he went without a goal for thirty plus games. Yeah, yeah, sure. And that's that is concerning from a third line center, right? But at the same time, he's being asked to just play defense and shut it down. Yeah, uh, and let his top six do all the scoring. And when he went on that thirty goal drought, um, I don't like for the first fifteen games, it just were at the top of the West. And so who cared? Like, yeah. The, yeah. It, it didn't really matter. And For then sure. they started to slide and people were like, Whoa, where's Adam Lowry? Mm-hmm. But I like in terms of the captaincy, that's a whole different conversation. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, but his on ice uh, production, I agree. Maybe forward thinking he's the four C over yeah. uh, instead of Nemesikov. But I think you're kind of splitting hairs at that point. For sure. For um, sure. But yeah, the center position is definitely something to monitor going into training camp because the Jets are kind of weak there. You can make the argument that if Perfetti doesn't pan out, maybe I guess Velarde can fill in, but but even then, you never know. You never really know, degree. right? Yeah, for sure. Exactly. Outside of the forward core, I I think the biggest storyline on the back end is the the log jam. The the pairings are pretty set in stone. That you know mm. who their 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 top six is going to be. But are we nearing another Jonathan Kovacevic situation with Logan Stanley, Declan Chisholm? I guess Kappa Bianco could be the odd man out, and that's not really like a, a drafted and developed prospect per se. He's still younger. He's 25, I believe. But if he looks great, if he looks better than Declan Chisholm in camp and they put him on waivers, it's a lock that Chisholm is getting claimed. Is it? Because I think so. He was an AHL all-star last year. Here's my counter argument to that. I don't know. I mean, am I, I railroading? Am I railroading this segment by diving? No, no, no. Here? This is yeah. this is the this is All the right, segment. Fair. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Here's my take about it. When Kovacevic hit waivers, there was two mm-hmm. things that people need to understand. For starters, the three year contract they tried to to void or block people from claiming him didn't work right. out. Okay, it didn't work out because I think that a lot of teams around the league believed, okay, if we take him, he doesn't pan out. All the the scouting reports and background checks of Kovacevic decline. He could be an AHL captain for us, a pricey right. one, sure, but um, that's a contingency plan. Something the Montreal Canadiens, with a lot of money and you know infinite budget for that kind of stuff, are fine with. Right. But also with Kovacevic, his skill set as a right hand defenseman, defensive oriented who can kill penalties, 
is much more rare and coveted than what you'll find Declan Chisholm. Now, let me say mm-hmm. this. Declan Chisholm is, is a very smart player. I love his toolkit. Two years ago when he played that 10 games with Jets, he was great. But mm-hmm. I think what people forget is a lot of Declan Chisholm's hit the waiver wire. And a lot of teams, when they're looking at the waiver wire, mm-hmm. might think that they have a Declan Chisholm that's better. Could a team be wise to take him? Sure. But look at the blue lines across the league. Like maybe Chicago takes a swing. Maybe. Um, but yeah. who? Kn- we also don't know. Like Jack Rathbone in Vancouver. He could hit the waiver wire. And I think that a lot of teams would rather have Jack Rathbone than Declan Chisholm. And there's yeah. other guys like that. So I-, I don't think it's a lock, especially when they send him mm-hmm. down. If they could do it in the second period, like when they got Mikey through the first time, E.C. Mont, right? right? Teams did l- like him that first time, but there were so many guys hitting the wire then it was too early in camp. The GMs weren't going to pull the trigger on it because GMs and teams not overvalue, but they, they really do value the players that they have brought in originally. Right. It's going to take a, a player that not, all, not like a, the scouts can really like a guy, but the director of pro scouting that's related to the GM who then makes his final call and he's dealing with so many different factors. So I, mm-hmm. I will argue I don't think it's a lock. Wouldn't be surprised if okay. it happened. But I don't think it's right. a lock. I that that's a good point. I've never thought of it like that, that there are all these other players like Declan Chisholm that are also hitting the wire. I just think 43 points in 59 AHL games, AHL All-Star, still 23 years old. I think a team if I if I was managing the Chicago Blackhawks or San Jose Sharks, I would take a swing on a guy that uh has shown at every step in the AHL that he can be an offensive force. The right? Sharks could take a swing for sure. The Sharks and then if, and Chisholm reunion. Yeah, there you go. And if like if it doesn't pan out, it's a one year deal for Chisholm. Oh, I hear you. And I hear you. Like yeah, yeah. I. It's definitely a risk, and it's it's oh, going to be interesting so, to monitor. Yeah. So yeah, sorry. To answer the second part of what you said mm-hmm. in terms of how they navigate it with that. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it's not a lock, but still, the question is, could there be a repeat? Like very well. Like I don't think it's a yeah. lock, but I want to reiterate, it could happen. There is that risk. Um, right. Do they keep do they keep Chisholm as a seventh defenseman? It's like, okay, well, they didn't keep Kovacevic, who I think would have been the perfect seventh defenseman. I think he would have been fine in that role. Um, right. Chisholm, I don't know. Like, I, who are you benefiting from doing that? Whereas Capabianco is a seasoned seventh defenseman, I guess you could say. Yeah. Um, so I think that you're right. The pairings are kind of set in stone at this rate, barring injury. Villy's probably back down with the moose. Yeah, um, I think I think insane. I think that's a lock. That Villy's back down. Even if he has agree. a great camp, I just a wa- he's a waivers casualty. Hundred percent. Like I think yeah. I don't see a situation where no. he can even beat anyone. So Bar- barring injury, yeah, he's, he's back down. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, which is going to be interesting to monitor as well. Because... Yeah, the, the Villy thing's interesting because it's like, yeah, you know, last November I wrote the story about how his camp yes. was very um, unhappy with the NHL opportunity. We're now. A year later from that, and in total, like this is like the third year Villy is going on the same situation. Um, yeah. Even last year, I can understand it, like from the Jets' perspective. Now, I still can understand it just because of the log jam they've self created. We have a discussion about they shouldn't have got themselves in the spot. That's another day, but right. like given where they're at, I get that that's what they're going to do. Right. But yeah, it's. Um, I think strictly from an asset management standpoint, it's disappointing for the Jets in the sense of, you know, of course, it, hindsight is twenty twenty, but you almost would wish they would have dealt him when his value was at the highest. Um, right. But you could say that about anyone. So, right. There's this is his going into his fourth year in the AHL. He, in the COVID year, he played nineteen games. Yeah. The year the year after that, forty one. Last year, forty eight. He played ten NHL games last year. Uh, Looked okay in them. Villy, every time he gets called up, looks kind of slow for the first few games and then settles in and really looks great for the remainder. But the mm-hmm. thing is, he's never gotten an extended stretch to really grow in the NHL. That's that's the whole thing his camp has was a bit was upset about, right? He hasn't gotten yeah. a, a, a shot in the NHL. He hasn't gotten a long look. Um, it's just so, so tough that, because I feel like yeah. there's always... And Paul Maurice started or put this out there publicly, but I think it's true this whole idea of you can only have like two six foot and under defensemen so pionk and morrissey and there's no more room for others is kind of weird only because i just think that like villy 
look, the 10 games he played last year, whatever it was, he wasn't great for a lot of it. But let's also remember he hasn't had as much leash as Stan or even like Veselinen as a forward as a first round pick. So it's hard to it's hard to blame him. Granted, let me just disclaim. Of course, you have to you know, NHL you gotta you gotta perform. So I get that. Right. But the whole idea is just so strange because you know it's easier said than done. But if you find a way to move Nate Schmidt, and then you have Dylan and Sandberg as your sandpaper per se that are physical, but also can move the puck um, and aren't dead weight out there. Mm-hmm. how can you not find a role for Billy? Like how can't like how, yeah. so that's the real question about this, but whether they can't offload Schmidt or they won't, whatever it may be, this is the situation they're in. And the options yeah. are very limited, frankly, maybe, maybe Billy's yeah. a trade ship at the deadline. I don't know. Maybe. And I wrote a, a couple weeks ago that if you can offload Schmidt and get 80% of what that Sandberg Schmidt pairing did last year in Hanela and Sandberg Hanela or Sandberg Chisholm, Sure. That's like from an asset management, cap space management. That is a that is a win, because yeah. Sandberg and Schmidt last year had and like and NHL 61% don't like risk. risk. That's the thing. Exactly. The risk Sandberg and Schmidt last year had like a sixty over a sixty percent expected goals rate. Yeah. Their Corsi was nuts. Like they they were they killed it in the third pairing. Mm-hmm. And if you can get fifty five percent out of Sandberg and Hanela and save six million dollars on the cap, that's it's easier said than done. I'll say that because offloading six million dollars in this NHL economy seems like a, an issue. Seems Absolutely, like, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, let's move off of the the log jam. We already talked about Billy as kind of a young player. That I mean, I guess we're kind of keeping an eye on, even though there isn't really a defined role for him in the NHL. Mm-hmm. What other players at Jets camp are you interested to to keep an eye on for the these next two weeks? I'm definitely looking forward to seeing brad lambert um i think i don't think he played great at penticton um but Mm -hmm. i want to say i don't put stock at all in those rookie games i i get it maybe from a uh team standpoint and players Mm -hmm. and whatever that it's beneficial but i i'm i'm not valuing that very much actually let me say i'm excited to see lambert and lucius so last year you know as we both saw with the moose both came in had different sort of like both had flashes of greatness they both went to juniors after um mm-hmm. lambo had a great run uh lucius got injured again unfortunately and his yeah. season was derailed again so now they're coming in a year older uh presumably bigger faster stronger you'd hope so and what i'm interested to see is okay how how do they size up against the regulars this year how do they look in tr- angel training camp as players that maybe make some noise Right, mm-hmm. like how, how are they going to compare? Because that's a big part of training camp in the first week. You see how the Colby Barlows, the Lamberts, the Lucius's are comparing against Mark Shifley and one-on-one drills. How they're playing against or playing with a Nikola Ehlers, whatever it may be. So, right. I'm interested to see that. I think Brad Lambert is the true question mark because is he a number? Like, is he an elite prospect or is he just a high, mm-hmm. a high upside? Um, great skill package player that continues to not be able to figure it out. That's what we're going to find out. Um, mm-hmm. There could be bumps in the road in the early part of his AHL tenure. We need to, people need to, to realize that. But I think for Brad, he gained a lot at the Thunderbirds uh, during the run and right. he got to play hockey as a, an impact player for the first time in a long time. So yeah. you're hoping that gives him a pep in the step. Lucius, um, I don't know if he's a question mark. I just, I, I got to, I'm curious. We don't know much about him either. Yeah. Um, I think he, he's got this, like, I, I'm curious to see what I like about Lucius. He has his courage to go to the net. Like he's not like a big imposing guy, but he'll get into the inner slot. He'll create chances. And he has that sort of net, he's got that goal scorer's touch, which is very mm-hmm. interesting. Um, right. I'm interested to see how he does in preseason games. And if, if he can actually make an impact in those contests. Yeah. And the Lambert bumps in the road that you're talking about last year in the HL, it was very bumpy for him. He had, like you said, the flashes, but him playing in structure, playing on a team where he's not the focal point offensively, we haven't seen it yet. I think sending him to the WHL and having him just dominate and get his confidence back was the best thing they could have done for his development. And I think it's going to pay off. So if he comes into training camp with that swagger, with that confidence, he could make some wild plays and the fans mm-hmm. will be tweeting it out sending videos, all this stuff, right? He'll, he'll make some real noise. Um, if he's able to make those, those splash plays in training camp and then Lucius, 
I mean, he was recovering from a shoulder injury for about 90% of the, of the uh, off season. Right. And is he even healthy? I don't even know. Um, we'll see. And the next storyline I want to talk about is, you know, we talked about Adam Lowry earlier as mm-hmm. his on ice uh, effect on the team, but off the ice, he was just named the captain of the franchise. How do you think that changes kind of like the dynamic heading into training camp, the the vibes between Rick bonus, the players, the captain C all that stuff. Do you think it changes much or is it same old, same old? I think that Adam Lowry has the characteristics to really make a big or, or make a big contribution to a culture change. Uh, it's no yeah. secret that and even Lowry Lee said it, you know, with Wheeler C off the chest last year, he was still looked at as the captain. Now it's the new regime. It's Lowry, Morrissey, and these kind of guys leading the pack. Um, it's going to come down to how much can Larry get this group to buy in, right? How mm-hmm. much can, and you know, your first year as a captain, there's some parts of it that I'm sure are tough in some ways, but Lowry's been here for a long time. He knows the interests of the locker room. He knows um, the challenges, the strengths, all, all everything that kind of goes in within there. So I think yeah. he's a great candidate to do it. I think it's also good for the team to have him being the one, you know, answering after games or whatnot. No need to put that pressure on Morrissey. Keep his momentum going. Let him focus on uh, the game and whatnot. Larry is, by all accounts, the perfect guy to to do that role, and I think it's going to be great. I don't yeah. I don't know if I can give a great answer in terms of can he make a big culture shift? Like, will it change or status quo? That's going to depend on the buy-in from players, and I think we'll it, – it's a conversation for April, right? It's like, okay, how was Adam Lowry's first year as captain? And I'm interested – and we'll, it's a big storyline throughout the year, but I think that – Lowry's extremely respected by his teammates. He is beloved by everybody in the organization, I can tell you, from top to bottom, and I really mean that. Yeah. I think that sort of like when Andrew Ladd was here, he had that similar um, pull, I would say, from yeah. a lot of people. Um, Blake Wheeler did at parts of his tenure as well, um, yeah. though towards the end, it, it got a bit different. So I think Lowry's definitely capable of doing it. It'll be interesting to see, though, if it happens. And keep in mind, it's not even just on Lowry to make that happen. Right, we can yeah. see there, there's other factors, other people, other personalities, and um, that could affect that. Yeah, I I 100% agree. Especially the thing you said about how everyone respects him. I think this was an absolute slam dunk pick for the captaincy. Mm-hmm. You could argue Josh Morrissey. I sure. made some arguments for Josh Morrissey, younger, longer contract. Sure, uh, he was the on ice leader. You could argue at times last year, but you you couldn't really go wrong with either of these guys. And Lowry, can he get? We're, we're going to talk about it in a second here. Shifley, who's on a, his contract is expiring. Hellbuck, contract expiring. Uh, Brendan Dillon, Dylan DeMello, Nino Niederreiter. All these guys have expiring contracts. So that buy-in yeah. and the successes that this team has in the first 30 games is going to be huge. Um, and that that is him as a captain. He's got to get that team to buy in, like you said. Let's talk about Shifley and Hellbuck. Um, mm-hmm. we haven't re- I haven't got your thoughts on the whole situation um, the whole off season. Now that we are heading into training camp, there are members of the team. Shevel Dayoff said he's comfortable going deep into the season with them on their team, even if they don't have an extension. Um, where do you kind of sit with this Shifley Hellebuck situation? And where do you think, how, how do you think it plays out? There's nothing wrong with Chevy doing this because the offers he received were suboptimal. So, mm-hmm. Do people want him to trade these two pillars for pennies on the dollar as opposed to having one more year of them as part of it? Like, no, like the NHL is a business. You know, for a long time, everyone was so drafted and developed. There was so impatient in this market about that. And then we started winning. And obviously things have gone sideways a bit. But, you know, a rebuild isn't easy. A rebuild is a, is a hard for business sell. And I think that if you're going to do it, you got to do it properly. So if someone comes in with a big offer for Shifley and Hellebuck, Chevy will look hard at it, right? Mm -hmm. But timing's big, right? So um, how do you think it plays out? This is a cliche answer, and I'm sorry, but it's the (laughs) truth. It depends how the first 25 games go. I just said that. I actually just said that like 20 minutes ago with Elliot. 25 minutes? No, I said, I said, yeah, yeah, I said. It will be defined in the first 25 games. Come the on. Jets get off to a hot start. Yeah. Well, look at that. Great yeah, minds think alike. alike. Look at that. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, like, I think that's exactly an interesting benchmark. Then if they're 
on the outside looking in or things implode or whatever, then you'll start hearing the chatter pick up. Then you'll start to hear, and that's when the marketing will really be set because yeah. there's two things. Both their contracts are very digestible, especially at towards December, January, where their daily cap oh, yeah. hits lower. Like those are very easy contracts to squeeze in. So there could be some some interesting assets there. I think the first 25 games too, they got to play LB more. Like if you're going to yeah. deal him, um, I guess in theory, if you're dealing Hellbuck, you're kind of punting on the year. So I guess it doesn't really matter that much. But still, even for Hellebuck, I think they've been playing him too much. I know he wants to play yeah. every night, but so that's interesting. Um, Shifley, uh, Shifley's got a lot to prove this year. And yeah. I think that is uh, something I'm assuming he's well aware of. He's dialed into this and he mm-hmm. needs to prove to 31 NHL teams that he's able to be an impact player every night and that he you know, gives a crap in the D zone. I think those things are important. Mm-hmm. If you if you think the Boston Bruins are going to go acquire Mark Sheffy to, to replace Bergeron or Krejci, you're <laughs> bonkers. Because yeah. the Boston Bruins are huge on buy-in from every way, and Mark Sheffy a lot of times hasn't showed that. So I think that's important to keep in mind with the whole picture. Um, and the fate is really in those two players' ha- like, hands, the sense of like, okay, you know, they're saying they're this year they're going to play it out and figure it out. Sorry, the fate's on their hands. Sorry, Chevy's hands. But it's going to be dictated by how the team performs. And there's no yeah. other way about that, especially with where we're at right now. If you got an offer that was digestible and acceptable, you would have done it. But I also think, I think a lot of us can agree, they should have done it at the end of 21-22. That's when they should have hit the reset. I think they should have moved Wheeler than two, mm. brought Bones in. Try- I think there would have been a lot, a much different narrative around this team if they had done it a year prior. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. They're They're a little late to this because now they found themselves in the situation where if for the first 25 games, what if they're the best team in the West? They they sure. were the best team in the West deep into December and January last year. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, they were better than Vegas, Colorado, every single team in the West that ended up going deep um, Seattle, they were better. Like I, I, I don't see a scenario where they are this year. I mean, they mm-hmm. totally, they totally could get off to a hot start. And then I said earlier, um, with Elliot on here that maybe if they're the top team in the West after 30 games, Shifley and Hellebuck sign one year extensions and just kick the can down the road. Say, okay, this team can be good this year. I'll play the rest of this year with this team and give this team some flexibility that I'll play the rest of the year um, and not leave them in UFA. So I don't get traded. And mm-hmm. then next off season, we'll do the exact same thing. Mm-hmm. I don't know if Chevy would go for that because then the offers would be presumably even worse mm-hmm. next off season yes. for an older Connor Hellbuck, older Mark with Shifley. a higher cap hit too, a higher cap hit. Yeah. You're older. Um, yeah. No, I agree. Yeah. So trade deadline. Um, and after the first 30 games, we'll know a lot more. For sure. If the, Jets, if the Jets struggle, I think, yeah, you, you can, they're you good. As gone. Yeah. Um, but it gets a lot more interesting if they, if well, they're the top case- team in the West. For sure, and it's funny because you can't really predict it now because of what we just said. Like Perfetti could thrive in the second line, like right. the second, the two C slot, but he could also struggle immensely. And this, you could say that for anything. But the point is, a lot of the Jets' key roles are huge question marks. Yeah, and I think even you know what I'll, I'll say it. It's even also a question mark. Like, can Josh Morrissey continue at this level? I swear you listened. You listened to the earlier part of our podcast. I wasn't on it. What do you mean? You (laughs) wasn't alive. No, but I said the exact same thing. Anyways, go ahead. This is why you brought me on to reinforce your (laughs) ideas when Elliot and Brian are here. But like, (laughs) can he? It doesn't have to even be points. Like, can he be a number one again? Like, that's also important. Will Neil Pionk rebound? There's so many questions that will will define this season for the Jets. And once those questions are answered, or as they are, then you'll get a better idea of where Shifley and Hellbuck fit into the equation this year and beyond. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I I brought up the shooting regression that's bound to happen for Morrissey. Um, he, you, he's at 37. Is his career high before this year? And he's exposed for 76 points. Now, I don't think he's going to go back to 37, but 55, 60, I think is a little bit more um, uh, realistic. Um, I I appreciate you doing this, Jacob. We are we're out of time. We've got through all of our questions. This was fantastic. Uh, Unreal, man. Let, let, yeah, plug yourself again. Um, tell people where you are, where they can find you. Find me on Twitter at JL Staller. And uh, yeah, you can find me all over the Hockey News, Yahoo, and um, 
yeah, that's kind of where where I am. Ready for a big season. Big season, big man. Season. Unreal. Yeah. Thanks for having me, bro. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Um, I'm sure we'll have you back on sometime. Yeah, in anytime, season bro. Re- revisit these takes. Maybe after 30 games. 25 games. I want to be here before 26 games. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll put it in the schedule right now. Perfect. Unreal. All right. All right. Thanks, man. Thanks, Jacob. All right.